نتيجة التقنيات التكنولوجيات هم يعتقدون بأنهم في الوقت الذي كانوا فيه أسياد العالم في فترة من 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 التاريخ كانت أوروبا في عصر انحطاط وهم كانوا في عصر النهضة حيقدموا كل شيء الآن العكس وبدل أن يبحثوا عن الأسباب هذا التخلف في أنفسهم يحاولوا أن يجيروا الأمور في اتجاه الطرف الآخر وهو أنه الاستعمار الغربي والغزو الثقافي و محاولة ابقاء العالم العربي متخلفا لكي يتم استغلاله ودفعه في اتجاهات تخدم السياسات الغربية اعتقد بان في هذا الاطار المتبقي والذي هو احد الاسباب التي تؤدي الى العمليات الارهابية الارهاب هو الان المسألة الاساسية بالنسبة لمنطقتنا وبشكل خاص هذا الهراب أعتقد أنه سوف يستمر إذا لم يتم إصلاح هذه المنطقة أيضا الدين لم يتم لم يمر الدين الإسلامي لم لم يمر في أي عملية إصلاح لحد الآن بعكس المسيحية التي مرت في مراحل من التطور يعني متدرجة إلى أن وصلت إلى عصر التنوير عندما تتحدث الآن مع أي مسيحي وتقول له ان الانجيل ربما يكون ليس كتاب الله ولا يقتلك ولكن عندما تقول لاي رجل مسلم بان القران ربما ليس هو كتاب نزل منه هو انما الرسول محمد هو الذي كتبه يمكن ان يقتلك في اللحظه وهذا وهذا هو الذي يعطي مؤشر كبير على غوغائيه المجتمعات العربية والإسلامية عندما تحدث أي إساءة للإسلام وأي إساءة للرسول إلى آخره هي هو هذه العقدة والإشكالية إذا إذا هذه تعتمد على قضية تفسير الدين هل نحن قادرين كمجتمعات على أن نفكر بشكل طريق بطريقة جديدة مثل المسيحيين ونحاول أن نطور الإسلام هنا يوجد كثير من من المصريين وهم يعرفون عندما حاول حامد أبو زيد الدكتور في جامعة القاهرة احداث نوع من التطوير ودراسة الإسلام من وجهة نظر جديدة جرى تطليقه من زوجته ونفيه وللسخرية عندما هاجر هذا الدكتور الرجل البروفيسور إلى هولندا كانت مصر تبعث له طلاب دكتوراه يدرسون عنده ويكتبون الدكتوراه في الوقت الذي هم طردوه من مصر ولم يعطوها أي فرصة لل للعمل هناك اعطيني فقط دقيقة واحدة لو سمعت حتى اكمل يعني هذه المسألة طويلة وتحتاج الى يعني الى وقت ولكن الاستنتاج الاساسي الذي يمكن التوصل اليه هو ان في مجرة في البلدان العربية خلال السنوات الثلاثة الاخيرة بعد كل من هذه الفوضى انه انتقل وينتقل من عملية تغيير الى عملية تحول تحصل من الداخل الديمقراطية هي عملية تختلف عن عمليات الدمقرطة لأن الديمقراطية ما زال ولكن الديمقراطية ما زالت غائبة عن الشرق الأوسط أعطيكم بعض المعطيات هناك في الشرق الأوسط معطيات رهيبة يمكن أن تحوله إلى قبل موقوتة تقرير يشير إلى أن حجم البطالة الآن في العالم العربي 20% من حجم السكان الكلي منهم 60% هم من الشباب هذه النسبة تتزايد بمعدل 3 إلى 4 سنويا في كل سنة ينضم إلى سوق العمل أكثر من 3 ملايين شخص تتجاوز أعمارهم 19 سنة يعني أنتم تعرفون مثلا في مصر حسب هذا التقرير مليون شخص ينضم سنويا إلى سوق العمل في سوريا 300 ألف في العراق 500 ألف التوقعات تشير إلى ارتفاع نسبة البطالة في عام 2020 إلى 150 مليون عاطل عن العمل هذه الحالة استثنائية وهي تسبب أيضا إلى جانب غياب مؤسسات المجتمع المدني واضطهاد المرأة وعدم الاعتراف بالأقليات وانعدام التعددية السياسية وضعف وتخلف العملية التعليمية والتربية كلها تشكل حاضنة للدغمة الدينية وتوسع أحزاب الإسلام السياسي وجاذبيتهم السياسية وبالتالي نحن عن أي ديمقراطية في المجتمع العربي نتحدث وأكثر من عشرة ملايين عراقي سنويا يذهبون من مدنهم مشيا على الأقدام للبكاء وللطم وللضرب في القامات وفي السلاجير 
من اجل بالبكاء على حفيد الرسول محمد الحسين في حادثة قتل وقعت قبل 1500 سنة هذه محاولة من جانب المؤسسة الدينية ومن جانب المؤسسات السياسية الحاكمة لتغييب دور هذه المجتمع ومطالبها الاساسية في التغيير اكثر اليوم في اليوم في معلومة من العراق انه اكثر من اربعة الاف عربي قاموا بعمليات انتحارية في العراق تصوروا الى اي مدى نحن نعيش اعتقد اننا امام ازمة كبيرة وهذه الازمة ازمة الديمقراطية لا يمكن ان تحل الا باصلاح الدين وابعادها بعدهم مطلقا عن السياسة شكرا جزيلا Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for this substantive and sobering view on, uh, on the region and also highlighting the role of religion and uh, mix between religion, politics, religious leaders. I think that this would be worthwhile to explore then in discussion. Uh, Julian, you are Bulgarian, but living in city in London where huge numbers of uh, people from the region of Arab world, but also from Central and Eastern Europe comes, uh, went and live. And uh, if you are listening all these trends, and uh, if you compare some of the things which went on in Central Eastern Europe, Bulgaria in particular, and uh, MENA region, if you could uh, take your take 10 minutes, and uh, then we will open it for discussion. Please. Thank you, Baba. Well, UK is also a country in transition. There is a, um, soon there will be a referendum for the independence of Scotland. So we don't know what will happen. So that will be, could be quite a major transition in the country. Um, but I would like to focus more on Bulgaria and uh, share some observations and uh, tell a few stories. Um, you all heard and most of you saw the Bulgarian protests. They're quite an interesting <laughs> phenomenon that deserves a little bit more attention. Um, they continue now almost five months on a daily basis. There is not one day missed since the beginning of 14 of June. And there are some quite peculiar, interesting things there. I was, a couple of months ago, I was here and walked in the, on the streets with the protest, opened my mobile phone, and so that there is a Wi-Fi which has the name of the protest, Dance With Me and ask somebody, what's that? And I said, well, that's the Wi-Fi of the protest. So the protest has its own kind of a, um, infrastructure, a very strange thing. Another interesting feature, recently there was an anniversary of the 60, uh, 1968 invasion and of the uh, smashing of the um, Prague um, spring uh, Prague uh, events in 1968 where Bulgaria uh, took part, uh, the Bulgarian army. So the protest made uh, kind of a special action of uh, apology to Czech Republic for 1968. This is typically something that is done by a state, by as an official, formal apology to another country back in history. That was done by a citizen movement on the street. Uh, we were talking quite a lot about the refugees and the inability of the state to deal with the refugees in Bulgaria. The protest is dealing with that. It's um, raising uh, money, help, and addressing this problem. I mean, these are just three small um, features of this movement which shows that this protest is not just a protest about something specific but it, it has a life of its own and it's a way in which the citizens and this is not a one single organization or five organization or 55 uh, 
civil society, NGOs or something. These are just self-organized citizens, which are in tens of thousands, are starting to take functions of the state, things that usually you would associate with the state behavior, international policies, refugee treatment, uh, um, policy, national policy statements, and so on. And at the same time, it's going on for five months, but if we look back at this protest, we'll realize that it's not five months, it's actually four years. This protest, you can trace them back for 2009. And one thing that I would like to suggest as a, as a hypothesis, that we're witnessing the appearance of, of something quite new, which is the state of a permanent protest, and also the appearance of something that I would uh, call a citizen state. I mean, citizen state is not a state where citizens are very active or there is active civil society. We know that from West European countries where the relationship with the between the state and civil society is quite well regulated and settled and civil society is active and it's working to, with all the checks and balances that Hassan was mentioning very early in our presentations. No, this is a, a situation in which a large group of citizens are actually starting to take roles that we usually associate with um, the state. And this is becoming a permanent situation. During the previous government, not the interim government, the government before, exactly this protest that had started in 2009 and reoccurred on a regular basis started having a huge impact on the government decisions. I mean, there were a number, I think, the only really successful Occupy movement around the world was in Bulgaria. Occupy Act, in which, which led to specific legislative change and political change. It was something to do with the forestry law. Um, so we are seeing this trend of uh, self-organized citizens, all organized through social media, but not the social media organizing them, which are gradually taking a very substantial part of what we usually would associate with uh, behavior of the state, and sometimes the state, quite often, becoming an executive <laughs> agent of this citizen movement. And that sounds very good. We say, okay, we're citizen state, lovely, so civil society is taking over, that must be good. Well, it might be good, it might not be good. In Bulgaria, the people who are protesting are, very simplistically, but good people. But in some extreme state, in some extreme uh, case, um, we might say that um, Libya is also a citizen state. I mean, a state where somehow you can't exactly see the state, but you can see the various groups and individuals who are acting in some way and taking over uh, functions of the state and actually the state is disappearing. Um, we don't know what will happen with that. But I was thinking of various historic um, examples, you know, something that I researched some time ago for a different reason. When the big floods in Pakistan happened in 2010, I mean, the state basically collapsed. They were completely unable to act and to do anything uh, for the rescue of people. Then the army stepped in, and naturally the army became the kind of the key organization that was running the country. But the army also collapsed and couldn't do anything. And then, in many, uh, in many areas where the uh, floods were really devastating, um, it was organizations that were very closely um, linked with Al-Qaeda, who took over all the rescue um, acts. So that was exactly such a 
extreme and quite a different from the Bulgarian protest case in which some kind of a citizen movement is taking over functions of, a, uh, of the state which is uh, weak and not being able to function. So we are now in this uh, um, quite uh, interesting situation very much because of the uh, social media and the, also the globalization of the um, of uh, communication in which we are starting to witness more and more these cases both in countries that have very weak state um, structures and in countries that have witnessed this transition to democracy but not fully completed like Bulgaria where the state started failing in some points and elements but also in quite advanced countries uh, where the social media and the individual participation of citizens is starting to have a very, very, very strong um, impact. And when we are talking about the transition to democracy, at the same time, at the end of this transition, we're seeing some kind of a crumbling model of democracy uh, which is being replaced by something else and this something else is full of massive uncertainty because exactly of these trends. And I think this is in various ways valid both for advanced countries, for the countries in this region, the new member states, but also of all the countries of the Arab revolutions. So I would finish with a simple question. Will that change the paradigm in which we were um, thinking about uh, transitional processes? Excellent. Thank you. Um, after when I mentioned that next year is 25th anniversary of these profound changes, series of revolutions in our region, some resulted already in membership of these countries in European Union. And if I was listening yesterday and today, I think that there are three very distinctive differences which I would like you to uh, comment on and Hassan, I will call on you uh, soon, is that after collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, militaries didn't play any significant role. Militaries, it was one of the things, needs to be under civilian controls. Many ministers of defense had to be civilians. So military was not stepping into our political transition. Second, religion and religious leaders didn't play any significant role in our transitions in, the, in these countries. They were busy with doing their own stuff, recreating many of their own relationships with state, but the extent in which church plays role or religious leaders are playing role in your countries, countries of MENA region, it's uncomparably higher. And third is uh, navigation process for our countries, membership in European Union was the key and conditionality was accepted both by elites and by public that we need to change our societies according functional models, you know, which Austria, Germany and our neighbors, we saw how prosperous they are, how well functioning they are. So all this idea that we want to change but we want to become part of broader, well-functioning European Union was navigated very often process of transition, both political, economic and social. And there was sort of symmetry between East and West. They wanted us to come and join and we wanted to join. In that case, there was relative agreement between us in understanding what we want. When I travel to Arab countries or MENA region, very often I hear 
we do not want to have American democracy, European, we want to have something, you know, we are different, special.